Hello, everyone, and welcome to Food Management's On Demand series. This is a healthcare version, and today we are talking with Morrison Chef Jeffrey Quasha, and he's Director of Retail Culinary Innovation. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And we're going to get down to the business of talking about um, getting the healthiest possible seafood dishes, using seafood for health. But before that, I got um, in between scheduling this, I got some really exciting news about you, which is you have been inducted into the American Culinary Federation, the ACF Honor Society, as a fellow of the American Academy of Chefs. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege, first of all, just to be asked to join or to be nominated to go into the American Academy of Chefs, but uh, definitely 15 to 20 years of, of hard work and effort. So thank you. Very cool. And if anybody's not familiar with um, the ACF, I'm sure many of our viewers know all about the ACF, but they're, they really are sticklers. I've seen, I've seen the ACF people judge competitions and they, it's by the letter, it's by the book, and they, they don't like to joke around with you while they're judging. I learned that the hard way, <laughs> but no, that's an awesome honor. So very, Thank very you. great thing for you. I'm so happy to see you recognized like that in, in our industry. Very cool. So let's get onto the seafoods. Um, Absolutely. We know that they're healthy, but people are afraid to cook with them at home sometimes. And then when you're dining out, if it's not a familiar seafood, sometimes customers don't want to order it. And then there's another obstacle, which is like food service people don't want it. They're afraid it may be more expensive. And then what, how do we hold it? So that's what we're going to be delving into today is your solutions. So starting with like, what's, what are some of your favorite seafoods to get that wellness thing going? Well, of course, you know, we're going to take a look at, you know, we have our staples, of course, you know, wild Alaskan salmon, uh, wild Alaskan cod, mahi mahi, tilapia, um, you know, for years, we've, we've had those main staples, um, including fresh tuna, um, swordfish, pegasus, swai, um, you know, and then recently, we started adding more underutilized seafoods. And I think that's a big part of what we're doing in healthcare these days, if it's mussels or clams or, you know, local, you know, what's coming off the boats, because uh, a lot of our purveyors have that opportunity to bring fresh and local. Um, so that's, the biggest thing, of course, when it comes to uh, health and wellness, I think portion size is a big key, but also, you know, when we're talking about antioxidants or omega-3 fatty acids, or, you know, I think that's a lot of it. We've really made a switch in the last couple of years, you know, more in line with menus of change where mm -hmm. protein has become a garnish versus center of the plate. I like so that. I think that's one of the biggest things that we've done with seafood is we've used more premium seafood, you know, making sure that it is sustainable or it's wild yes. uh, in order to give an elevated experience. And that can keep your costs down if you're using a smaller amount on the plate mm -hmm. and then like a whole bunch of rice or something else that's not as expensive right. for sure. And going back a little bit more to the antioxidants, in the healthcare setting, um, I guess speaking more like retail, but patient side also, um, the people who you're serving, it makes a difference for them to know that it's healthy, but it also has to be appealing. So let's talk about some of the specifics, like how you're, how you're kind of accomplishing that with seafood. So, you know, when I first worked, started working for Morrison, I think, you know, a lot of our LTOs were wellness designed or wellness based. And we kind of figured out down the road when we started, you know, if you go to a restaurant hypothetically and you have like the wellness section, basically like if it's on a, uh, a Chinese menu, yes. they put like the wellness section. A lot of people don't want to move towards the wellness section or don't want to be told that that is better for mm -hmm. you. If you design a bowl, like I was just talking about in line with menus of change. So hypothetically we have a, uh, for Onalicious, which is our Hawaiian concept, we have a sweet and sour mahi mahi sticky rice bowl. So that bowl is, you know, four ounces of basmati rice or grains with two cups of vegetables, sauteed, pickled, or fermented, oh, yeah. and then a piece of fish on top that's, you know, three to four ounces at most. So that bowl is under 500 calories as a build, and we're not necessarily screaming it's 
better for you. Yeah. And we're not identifying it with an asterisk that it's wellness based. But what we are doing is we're creating a menu with intention. And I think that's the biggest piece. Our menu is, is developed with intention to be a better for you bowl build. But yeah. we're not telling you, we practice, we call it self health. Um, we're making healthier food. We're just not necessarily telling you every time. Yeah. Yeah, because people don't want to necessarily have it in their face. And right. I think that's true of um, like labeling things like vegan or vegetarian, because people who don't um, identify as a vegan might feel like that's not for me. Like I'm not allowed to have that type thing. So it's like if this is just a delicious entree, for sure. Um, and speaking of the um, retail side still, I still want to talk about that. What are some good examples of some of these um just entrees that that have done pretty well you mentioned that bowl what are a couple other ways you've done so about five years ago we started creating pop-up concepts we called them micro concepts which were complete station takeovers um you know that could be run for three days five days seven oh, days uh, where yeah. we we took like atypical trend genres like cajun you know creole taco so Along those lines, within those concepts, we would have like fish tacos or within our taco shop, or we have another concept that was like the ideal, when you got off the beach and you went to that shack, and then, you know, was there an oyster po' boy or a crab cake sandwich or a lobster, you know, we have lobster shack, which is lobster, you know, a lobster roll, but then on our, um, our flat top concept, which is our quesadilla, there's a lobster quesadilla. So, what we did is we took those micro concepts and we actually simplified them a little bit more to create pop-up restaurants, which is a one day takeover of a station. So with that, I can, we can go in and just do one trend quick and fast, and then it pops in and pops out. So with that, you know, there's fish and chippy, you know, if you're taking that wild Alaskan Pollock and we're deep frying it, of course, and then we have a baked version for healthcare. Um, but instead of trying to do too much and overwhelm them, it's, I call it the five guys methodology. Um, you know, you go to Five Guys to get a hamburger, a cheeseburger, and a hot dog, and that's it. You don't go there for a chicken sandwich. No. So if you're going to run fish and chippy on the grill as a grill takeover, and you're not going to use beef or mm -hmm. for that one day, all we're going to sell is fish and chippy. I like that very much. And I, Five Guys is so good. And I, I haven't, I haven't been to one in a while. It's I'm way overdue. There's one not too far from me. Right. Um, and I feel like the speaking of fish and chips, like that is a an idea and a concept that like really it's kind of classic and it's um I was just reading this thing Ohio is I think it's only in Ohio we have like a few of these Arthur Treacher's restaurants right. which are kind of like a cult favorite and they're this weird thing and like I never thought anything of it but like other people will make a pilgrimage to see it's like this is the last you know one of the last three standing and that's not the right data but um and Gordon Ramsay is just opening um his own fish and chips because right. you know he's British, and it's—I feel like if you're British or Scottish, <laughs> it's your, one of your favorite things. It's just amazing. Um, do you feel like malt vinegar is the thing that goes with that, or like what were you in your concept? What were some of the accoutrements to put with it? So of course we had our own tartar sauce versus doing and definitely a, a oh, Cajun ragout. But you know I would be in trouble if I didn't mention malt vinegar. I think my wife would would scream at me because you can't serve fish and chips without malt vinegar. Um, our, our potato, I'm not a potato, our french fries are actually brined. And I think that's one of the secrets. Um, you know, I didn't, I always, I always look at what other people are doing. And of course, with Gordon Ramsay's, but, you know, I think I take that from Chick-fil-A, you know, brining your, your potatoes and pickle juice and then deep frying them just gives them another, another yeah. element of umami or depth. And I think that's what's separating us from like the atypical French fry. But even the batter, I mean, it has to stick. It can't fall apart. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, we've done a lot of R&D when, when we put together a concept that takes us six months, I'd say, from ideation to implementation, um, which is great because it sets us up for October, which is like National Seafood Month. But then when we get to February, March, where we're looking at Lent, um, mm -hmm. you know, having programmings like fish and chips, you know, seafood quesadillas, mahi fish tacos, um, instead of struggling to write a menu, the menu kind of writes itself. 
Yeah. Yeah. Lent was my favorite thing about growing up Catholic. I was like, oh, we get to go to a church basement where these ladies have made this mm. wonderful fish fry and there's coleslaw. <laughs> I was like, this is not, this is such a punishment. Like, I'm so sad. <laughs> <laughs> we loved it. <laughs> Just amazing food coming out of the church basements of Lorraine, Ohio. <laughs> and the tartar sauce was something there was, um, I forget which one, I think it was a Polish church, but they were known, they had a homemade tartar sauce. And that was, I would, would know to get, to get that when I was there. For sure. And before I forget, let's talk about how, if you are in a hospital, how can you offer um, seafood and fish in a patient feeding situation? Because as we all know, there's issues with, there's a just perennial, like you're bringing things up. There's, you know, different pieces and parts and every hospital is different. Like maybe there's the holding times or however you're working it. Like what are some good ways that you found? Yeah. Well, I would say that we don't have like, we do, we Sometimes, yes, we have a patient menu and of course we have retail menus, but in all actuality, I just think our it's not just, there's no line or division, it's our food. You know, the same food we're serving in retail is the same food we're serving in the doctor's lounges and all of our retail spaces. So there's a lot of cross utilization of the same recipes. Um, our chefs are absolutely amazing. Chef Neff, um, the VP of culinary. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of it is about testing, of course, but you know, the, the leaner pieces of fish like Pegasus or Swai or, or a flatter fish like Flounder, yeah, I mean, those are harder fish in order to put on a patient tray and then of course travel the distance. Right. So what we've learned is a lot of the fish um, that we're looking at, you know, like salmon, um, you know, that holds up really well, but it's all a lot about sauces or nages or broths or, you know, making sure that that piece of fish isn't necessarily just going on top of the plate, which of course is warmed and then it's traveled. Um, and then take into consideration uh, seasonality and then what's available uh, in that region. So a lot of our patient dishes might be more regional based. It might be a gumbo or an etouffee or yeah. a version of Savannah red rice that has a beautiful piece of local fish mm -hmm. on top of that. Or it might be fried fish or it might be fish and chippy depending where you are up north. Um, you know, especially we have a lot of accounts on the West Coast now, so there's more of, of an influence of lo local or if it's fennel infused or there's orange. So we're, we use a lot of liquids and broths and seasonings and in order to make sure that the fish, when it travels, uh, it stays moist. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the biggest things is nobody wants a really dry piece of fish. No, that's the thing. I think that's what people are afraid of too when they're cooking it. And another thing to be afraid of is I experienced some salmon burnout over the summer. I, I had gotten um, sort of like a, like with some Alaskan fishermen, like they send you, it was like a subscription, but, or, you know, like a right. CFA, but for fish. And I got so much and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just one, it's just me and my daughter living here. And it's like, we can't eat this amount of salmon. So what are, when you get the flavor fatigue for something like salmon, what are some of the sauces and the flavor profiles that you go to, to freshen it up? And this is just for my own personal use. No, no, absolutely. So we have 10 entree stations. We actually took our atypical entree meat and three station. We blew it up like two years ago and we created 10 theme stations. And, and within those themes, it gives me a lot of playground. So like Kalaloo is our, our Caribbean station and Smokehouse is our barbecue station. Honest Bowl is more like Cover Grill. So, and then, so within those lines, you know, Basmati and Spice is a concept that we developed recently with Chef Paul. Mm -hmm. we, we actually took a lot of, you know, our seafood, you know, and it might be snapper or mahi or salmon. And then I started plugging them into one of those categories. So with Smokehouse, you know, taking an entire salmon loin skin on and then rubbing it with a you know Carolina barbecue sauce and then you know McCormick brown sugar spices. That's the easiest thing that you can do when you put that in a 400 degree oven and roast it for 15 minutes. So it's a little bit around medium. But like that. that flaky barbecue, that that smokiness and the yeah. sweetness, yeah. Um, and then you have that vinegar that ties it all in, but it also helps to keep seasoning. When I make stuff like that, or if we make that in a hospital setting, we just added that to our smokehouse. You know, that's something that our chefs can can take and then that can be flaked it can be put on top of a baked potato it can be put on top of loaded macaroni and cheese or cauliflower mac and cheese yeah the same but way it's also barbecue like same. why does barbecue just have yeah super cool using it as you know and then from a, a caribbean standpoint you know oh yeah right super cool but like we just did a um a snapper escovich 
Um, so, you know, taking some classical dishes from the Caribbean, if it's jerk or an escabeche, um, you know, that people can identify with. I think if you create a crazy name for something, then you might scare people away. But, you know, I think because of Pinterest and Instagram and yeah. uh, other social media aspects, people are more cognitive of dishes like jerk or escovich. So true. that's helped. Or curry. I think curry has is, is become acceptable. You know, Indian curry and then, of course, Thai curry. Um, so a wet curry, like with a coconut base, is perceived wellness. So that might be a great opportunity for your salmon dishes at home, too. That is that is a delicious idea because the, the concept of taking coconut milk and like some green Thai curry paste or red Thai curry paste mm -hmm. and it, doing something with that, that works pretty well for me. So thank you for that little sidebar. And, <laughs> and there is one more thing we wanted to talk to you about, and that was um, the ghost kitchens. So I think we touched on that just a little bit where those different concepts, is that the same thing or is, how, tell us about the ghost kitchens. So we you know, in the middle of the pandemic, I think last March, we kind of blew up some of our methodology if we could rethink what we're currently doing and what does our business future look like. And then we're looking at, you know, a lot of ghost kitchens popping up all over the country. So, you know, some of our catering spaces had to be reimagined because we take care of the entire hospital. Yeah, but using tech, um, you know, I think that's the biggest piece of the ghost kitchen. And then having a kitchen where you it's four walls you can't see into. So one of the concepts that we created is um, 10 concepts from 37 ingredients, which goes into, you know, that's cool. Menuing with intention or the rule of three, which are two of my favorite things. But, you know, could you imagine if you took 37 ingredients, like a coleslaw mix, and you deconstructed the coleslaw mix to the red cabbage, the green cabbage, which could be not cabbage, Julian onions and Julian carrots. If you had those four ingredients and you added an Alabama barbecue sauce to that, and then you put that on top of a bun, a brioche bun with pulled pork, or it could be the barbecue sandwich that we just talked about. And now you have this amazing barbecue sandwich. But if you took those same four ingredients, the, um, the coleslaw mix, and you put them in a bowl with basmati rice, and then you put a sriracha honey and salmon on top, then now you have like a play on a boodle bowl using wild sustainable seafood. But if you took those same four ingredients and then you threw like a quick pickling juice on top uh -huh. and you put that on a baguette with sriracha mayo and uh -huh. you could put that same salmon or any sea seafood or pulled pork on top and now you have a bon me. On me. So that's, that's cool. kind of been our process. I love that. And it's like talk about reducing food waste too while you're at it and getting a minimal amount of stuff and for sure. All right. Well, I, I wish we had more time to talk. And especially once we start talking about barbecue, I could talk all day because I've, I've got many thoughts. <laughs> but um, really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Congrats again on, on that thing from the ACF. That, that is awesome. We are so proud of you cool. and we're going to continue to stay in touch with you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.